Welcome, Dr. Payne. Thanks for spending some time with us today to talk about your new book, Boys in Poverty. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be with you. Please tell us a little bit about Boys in Poverty. Well, it's a book about, obviously, Boys in Poverty and why they drop out. And one of the things that I think is fascinating is that if you look at the numbers of who are dropping out, they tend to be a, a disproportional percentage of boys and a disproportional percentage in poverty. I think because of resources that you have available to you in poverty or don't have available to you, it's very difficult to succeed in school. School is a place, it's a box that you have to have a great deal of resources to negotiate, typically. And what we've done historically, we've taken children who are very resourced, we've run them through this box called school, they come out more resourced. And historically what we've done is we've taken students who are less resourced, run them through the box called school, and a lot of times they drop out. And a challenge right now is to get them through that box in a way that they continue and actually come out more resourced than when they went in. How does this book differ from the other books you've written about poverty, and why did you choose to go in that direction? Well, the other books I've written about poverty are really about poverty in the generic. It's not about poverty as a systems issue. It's not about poverty as a gender issue. It's about poverty as a cognitive issue what the marriage between your environment and your resources and your thinking then do to how you negotiate institutions that are primarily middle class. And school primarily is middle class. And we went in the direction of boys for this reason. I, I have a lot of empathy for boys in the fact that my brother, who had a great deal of difficulty in school, uh, had a great deal of difficulty then with negotiating parts of his life. I have seen so much talent um, undeveloped in uh, boys in poverty. And one of the things that any society needs, that any community needs for stability, is it needs work for its males. And part of what happens now, because we're in a knowledge-based economy, if, if you're a male, you have to be able to be educated so you can negotiate an economy. And so I basically have a pretty soft spot in my heart for uh, males, for the kinds of things that they may or may not have the opportunity to get in school. Schools right now are not very board friendly. And so we could do much more, develop much more talent if we were just a little bit more knowledgeable about it. How is the book structured to benefit educators, and who is your target audience? Well, the book is structured by age frames, and it's also structured by the social development of boys, the emotional development, the cognitive development, and then again, the physical development, and all of these are factors in their ability to do well. The target audience is actually educators and parents. One of the things we broke it by age, brought down by age level, so that if you were an educator or a parent and you had a boy that level or that age, you could hone in on that and look at it that way. One of the mistakes we make in the school business is that we think learning is just primarily cognitively. And basically what we know is all learning is emotional and cognitive because it's double-coded. I'll often ask an audience if they have a subject that they had in school that they hate. And then I'll ask, did you hate the teacher? And a lot of times they'll say yes to both because you code something emotionally by the relationship that's involved, and then that really impacts significantly your coding of the content. And so your understanding of students is absolutely critical in your ability to also teach them that. So that's our target audience is parents and educators because they're the primary teachers of uh, children. What is the best way for an educator to use this book? Well, what I recommend is that 85% of educators are female, and many of them, if not most of them, have a son or have a nephew or have a brother or have a niece or have a husband. And one of the things about this book is it actually helps them understand 
their close relationships that might they might have. So when I recommend how they use it, I'll say, well, you want to be thinking about it at two levels. One, your personal interactions with people who are close to you, and number two, your interactions with students at school. Those boys in your classroom, okay? How are you seeing them? Are you seeing them differently? Do you understand that when they get an emotional hit, they don't take it this, or process it the same way a female brain does? So do you know how to negotiate and deal with that? So an educator, I recommend they look at the target levels they're dealing with, the ages, and then also particular areas that they might be more concerned about, like emotional development or physical development. Uh, then there's several chapters in there about special issues with boys, uh, drugs, issues around um, whether you're a gifted boy or, or a gay boy or just a different boy, um, how video games impact your thinking. So there's a lot of information about there that can be used a lot of different ways, but primarily for understanding and then teaching your students. You write that dropout prevention is a process. Can you expand upon that process? Well, we like to think it, many people think it's an event, but actually the process, it's a process of disengagement. And uh, that's Clemson's university's uh, definition, and in my opinion, it's the very best one. When we were researching this book, we researched a lot of different research bases about dropouts. And some of them were looked at it from the dropouts perspective, some of them looked at it strictly as a school problem, like there's one uh, research institution that just really hammers on schools. Uh, some of them look at it as a um, individual choice. Several studies try to assign blame. I thought Clemson University did the best job because they basically looked at four characteristics that really impact whether or not you're going to drop out. One is the individual student, the second is their family, the third one is the community that they're in, and then the fourth one is the school. And what we know is there are community effects, for example, that create a disengagement process. And it starts young, like there are red flag behaviors that the book highlights. Start quite young, attendance, um, things like uh, engagement with the teacher or the class. There are several things that occur. Moving, high mobility really impacts your ability to finish school. And so we look at the kinds of factors very, very early on that start the whole disengagement process. And we would really recommend that if a school district is really serious about dropout prevention, that they begin then no later than fourth and fifth grade identifying the ways that the disengagement process is impacting their own students. If an educator is committed to mitigating dropout among his or her students, what is that educator's role in the process? Well, first of all, the highest the highest thing is whether or not you have a relationship of respect with that that uh, te that student, whether the teacher does. Since all learning is coded against the relationship, one of the things we know, particularly if they're from poverty, is they're basically not going to learn from somebody they don't like. I was just in a, a, a school the other day, and the assistant superintendent was telling me about fifth grade boys who failed the exit level state test and had to repeat the fifth grade. And she was interviewing the boys who failed. And it was a fifth grade boy, and he said to the assistant superintendent, well, I just didn't like the teacher. So I got even with her. And the assistant superintendent said, don't you understand that you have to repeat the grade now also? Well, the student didn't understand. He just understood he didn't like the teacher. A study that uh, Goldman talks about in his book, uh, Social Intelligence, the study that was done with first graders, 910 first graders, and if they were at-risk students, it didn't matter if the teacher was excellent. If they perceived the teacher to be cold and controlling, they refused to learn. So one of the things I say right off is let's build a relationship. And it's not about being their friend. It's about high expectations, insistence, and support. And it's about I care about you. I expect you to learn. I'm going to support you while you do that. But it's really critical in that whole process. The second thing is to analyze a student's resource base. 
what are the student's resources? Because interventions simply do not work if they are based upon a resource that a student doesn't have. For example, let's just talk about discipline. One of the things we know is that when a female gets an emotional hit in her brain, partly because of the way her brain is structured, and this is true for 90% of females, the emotion kind of floods the brain, and the, the female brain almost instantaneously has an emotional response. But in the typical male brain, the base of the skull is where emotion is processed. It literally, in the studies they've done with MRI scanners, it takes five hours for that emotional information to transmit through the brain, the whole brain. Well, one of the things that educators do, and female educators in particular, a student does something, they immediately want them to talk to them right now, talk to me about this, tell me what happened. Well. That's not going to work for your typical male. Don't just sit there and be silent. A friend of mine who's a behavioral specialist, one of the things he does when he disciplines a male, and this is elementary school, you could do it all the way on up, but he has a four-inch bouncing ball, and he'll three-inch, and he'll say to them, okay, here's the rule. I'm going to bounce it once, and you pick it up, and then you bounce it once and bounce it back to me. Well, they do that about three times, and they'll say, well, tell me what happened, and they'll start talking immediately because they have something to do. And the typical male brain needs something to do with their body if you also want them to uh, work with what is upsetting them emotionally. Uh, so there are things like that. So what are the resources of the student? Does he have a support system? Does he have a relationship? Is physically, is his body working? Is he hungry? How is he handling anger? Because when you make interventions, and part of the interventions are knowing about a male brain, it helps a great deal in your how effective you are in the learning process for that student. While researching this book, were there any findings that surprised you? Oh, yes. I mean, one, of course, was the thing about the male brain and emotion, but another one is this. The, the typical male retina, now when I say this, I'm talking about 90% of um, males, they don't. They absorb, if I remember correctly, about 20% less light than a female retina. So one of the things that's just fascinating is that when you talk about detail around color or um, you ask a female, they'll say, well, it's seafoam green. You ask a male, they'll say, look, it's green, okay? They just don't see the color gradations. Well, another thing that surprised me tremendously is that the way male brains are hardwired, they do not hear as well as female brains. Now, whenever I say that as in an audience, every woman in the audience laughs. But the way that translates to the school business is this. If you put a, um, you have a soft-spoken elementary female teacher and the male sits in the back, they may not hear everything the teacher says. And so they're wandering off in their mind. Um, the next thing they know, they're diagnosed as ADHD, when in reality, they just don't hear at the same level. So one of the recommendations we often make is if you've got a soft-spoken female teacher, put the males in the front of the room so they can hear better. Um, like here's another one. Male eyes are track, track movement. They track movement much easier than female eyes do. Female eyes track detail easier than male eyes do. So one of the things that happens in a kindergarten classroom, for example, they give some the color, the little girl colors inside the line, pays attention to detail. The little boy takes his crayon, just scribbles all over the paper. Well, the teacher says, oh, sweetie, that was so nice, she says to the little girl. And to the little boy, well, honey, try and stay in the lines. Well, what happens is he immediately picks up nonverbally her unhappiness with him. And so he really doesn't quite understand what happened either. So one of the things that we often talk about is just knowing those little things makes a huge difference in how you, you approach the learning.
What do you think is the most important message from Boys in Poverty? Uh, that their talent can be developed, that we don't have to have the situations we have right now, that we simply do not need to have the number of dropouts we do. I, For me, it's an issue around the survival of America. I really don't think that we can continue to have males not getting college educated, not being able to finish school at the levels we have right now. Because part of what makes a society stable is when they work for people, particularly males, and so and females as well. I don't want to I don't want to lessen that or undermine that. But if you look at societies that are not stable at all, you have a lot of societies where there's virtually almost no work for men, and that's problematic. So I hope that everyone understands it doesn't have to be this way. Thank you for sharing additional insights into boys in poverty. Is there anything you would like to add or expand upon? Well, I feel like I should clarify one last thing I said in that I lived in Haiti for three and a half months to study poverty. And Haiti has been in the news repeatedly in America for the last year. And one of the things I never understood until I lived there was two things. How how very important public education is to the well-being of a society, a group of people. And how very, very critical it is that you always, always have work for males and females because you have role identity. What Americans don't understand is that when you don't develop the talent of your people, both male and female, the problem is then you can't have a stable community and society. And so for me, it's absolutely critical that we not lose girls or boys to dropping out. And because we're losing a disproportional amount of boys that we don't need to lose. That was one of the passions behind the book. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Payne.